What? World events. Now, tonight's subject is living in a world of fake news. Did you ever hear that term before? Fake news. Oh yeah, tonight we're going to look at this in quite a bit of detail. Just a word or two about myself. Who am I? I'm Dr. Reinhard Stander. I'm originally from South Africa. I'm residing here in the USA with my wonderful family. I'm a theologian specializing in prophecy in scripture and I'm pastoring. And so I'm very excited to have this series and these seminars with you. Just a note, now this is very important. I, can't, I cannot st um, start this seminar without giving this note. There are many issues we can spend time with, but my goal is to see the bigger picture. I will not engage with partisan politics, therefore try not to listen to this message with your political filters on. At times it may appear I'm leaning towards one side and at other times towards the other side. I am not. Are you there? Yes. These lectures will not be political, but biblical and prophetic. Uh, is this very clear? And another note I just want to bring to your attention is seeing that we are going to study the book of Revelation and venture to understand the prophetic events taking place in the world right now, like the Antichrist and New World Order, I'm not ashamed to show the reality of Jesus Christ. Amen? And ask you to put your trust in Him. Yes. There's no sense in trying to avoid the Antichrist and his schemes, but you are disregarding Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I will not be ashamed of him, and this is what we will see throughout this seminar series. So we're going to start with a story tonight. Who of you know this guy's name? Anyone? Pinyas Gage. He was an American railroad construction foreman in the 1840s, and he had a very specific work. One day on September 13, Gage was directing a work gang blasting rock while preparing the roadbed south of the village of Cavendish, Vermont. And something happened. What happened? Setting a blast entailed boring a hole deep into an outcrop of rock, adding blasting powder and a fuse, then using the tamping iron to direct it into the rock. His men distracted him, looking over his right shoulder. In that same instant, the tamping iron sparked against the rock and the powder exploded. Gage's mouth was open at the moment of the explosion and the iron went through his face, brain and skull. This was an extraordinary story. Uh, if you're a bit sensitive, don't look at this picture. But this is how it happened and it went right through and he lived. He went to the doctor and he said, doctor, this went through and the doctor didn't believe him. Uh, after... <laughs> Observing, the doctor said, oh man, there's a whole hole through your brain, your skull. Now, when we look at the human brain, it is one tissue of mass that is just extraordinary. There's different uh, compartments in your brain, and I want to focus on the frontal lobe, this front part of your brain. You see, according to science, the frontal lobe is where your intelligence resides. It is where your decision-making power is. It's where your self-awareness is, character, integrity, willpower, motivation, morality, judgment, spirituality. And so what happened when this iron went through his brain? What happened? Can you see? His frontal lobe was totally demolished. And when you read the book about his life, something happened to his life. He was not the same anymore. Previously, he was a decent person. Afterwards, he started swearing. He started cursing, drinking. His whole behavior changed. Why? Because of his frontal lobe that was damaged. Is your frontal lobe important? What do you think? It's critical to you making the right decisions, having spirituality in your life, and knowing what you're supposed to do. Now listen here. Your subconscious... And your unconscious mind is directly affected through your senses, bypassing your what? Your frontal lobe, which decides what is true. And this is the problem. This means that what, uh, what you experience through your senses becomes your reality and your standard for truth. Your experience then defines your frame of reference. And here's today's problem. In this lecture, we will discover how we are lied to which means that our experience should not be a standard of truth. 
Can my standard of truth be the TV? No, it bypasses my frontal lobe, and, and after a while I cannot distinguish between right and wrong. Now, when we look at illusions, what does the dictionary say about an illusion? An illusion is a distortion of the senses, revealing how the brain normally organizes and interprets sensory stimulation. While illusions distort reality, they are generally shared by most people. Illusions may occur with more of the human senses than vision. Don't underestimate your, the rest of your senses. Another dictionary says existing or operating below the threshold of consciousness insufficiently intends to produce a discrete sensation. You may not even know that you are viewing an illusion and you believe it for a fact. It bypasses the frontal lobe. Being or designed to be intense enough to influence the mental processes or the behavior of the individual. And so I want to share with you this warning tonight. Do not be fooled. Make the choice not to believe everything you see, hear, feel, and experience. Are you there? Absolutely. And so I want to ask you a question tonight. Count the total black dots on the board, please. Anyone? Can you tell me how many black dots you see? Look intently. How many black dots are there? It's more than one. Question, can your eyes focus on that picture? What's wrong with that picture? Are the top lines of these trapezoids the same length? The top lines. Some say no, some say yes, some say don't know. It is the same. Don't let it fool you. Who of you can tell me what do you see in that picture? I hear an old lady. What else? A young lady, it depends how you view it. Can you see the young lady in the front? Yeah. Or oh, this is the big nose, the chin of the young lady makes the, the old lady. Now we all know this picture. This has been with us for ages, but that's an illusion. What about this? What do you see there? Yeah, it's a tree, there's birds, but what else do you see? Can you see that to your subconscious there's a message being sent that there's an actual face? Who of you can tell me, besides the actual people you see, if you can see faces in this picture? Can you see it? Yeah, they're in the clouds. It's a picture. Can you see any other faces in this picture? They're in the tree, yes. Where else? Yeah, in the bushes. There you see it. Look at all those faces. It's hidden in plain sight. And yet your brain can say, oh, I see some faces there. Is that moving or is that standing still? It's standing still. It's an illusion. Can you see the illusion? What is that? Can anyone tell me what shape is that? <laughs> that is not a square, believe me. What is that? It's playing mind games. Can you see? With your mind. What, what do you think is that? Is that no, that's not a seesaw. I can <laughs> promise you that's not a seesaw. <laughs> now, if you walk here at the harbor, you, would, might, you might think, oh man, I'm going to fall here into the sea. There's a hole. But guess what? It's illusion. Someone just painted it on top of the floor. Can you see the illusion? And so I can spend the whole evening going through all these illusions. You see, here is a classroom, and the teacher decided, I want to share with my students about illusions. And so they painted, it's a point of view. Can I show you the actual point of view? There's the point of view. Everything depends the angle you view it, how you see it, how you sense it. Otherwise, you're going to be deceived. Can you see that? Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Now, years ago on text, we all received this text about God's hands in the clouds. Guess what? It was Photoshop. There's the original picture. Those were not God's hands in the clouds. And so people are easily fooled. I should be careful not to be fooled. And that is where fake news comes in today. When we see something, when we read something, when we hear something, we are in the habit for many years now, oh, it should be true, especially when it's by an authority. Now, what did Thomas Jefferson say about this? He said, listen now, this is in 1807. This is 200 years ago and more. The man who never looks into a newspaper is what? 
better informed. Do you believe that? <laughs> the man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them. Inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer to truth than he whose mind is filled with what? Falsehoods and errors. How would you know? And so he said, you are better informed without it. Now, interesting. Just last month, Axios poll shows that the percentage of Americans who say they have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in newspapers are only 16%. Isn't that amazing? Um, television news, only 11% in the U.S. trust the news. Now, is there a reason for that? I think there's a reason for that. You see, everywhere you see, you see fake news. And people these days are trying to get on cameras showing, oh, this is fake news, this is fake news. Now, I'm going to show you a few clips, and you decide by yourself, is everything I see or hear the truth? Okay? Look at this. Get out, dude! You got a, you got a, uh, Look very a, a power cord? He's going off from camera. He's, oh, someone is going to drown there. I need to help him. Now look very carefully when he gets across you got a rope? the screen and the camera me, follows please, him. Please, please. Not that long. Look very carefully. Hold on, I'm trying to get you a rope. All right, buddy, come on, get up out of that water. No, don't, don't, don't go backwards. You all right? What do you Take see? No, no, ma'am. Can you see No, ma'am, we got a car in a ditch. We just pulled a fellow let, out. Let me show you very carefully. Oh, he gosh. had shorts on when he ran to save the man in the water. Can you see that? And nine seconds later, literally nine seconds later on TV, he has pants on and boots and he's still saving the man. Now, can you tell me if you're going to save someone busy drowning, are you quickly going to get dressed? Really? Don't believe everything you see. Senior international correspondent is Ben Wiedemann. He is live for us on the Syrian border. We can see the sun is coming up, Ben. So good morning to you there. Up. You are there on that border. It's daylight now. What's the reaction? Uh, more than, uh, more than 400,000. They were killed by the regime, not Listen by ISIS. And therefore, many Syrians will be happy to see some sort of punishment. Uh, what is happening? Can you hear the echo? He's not outside, as the presenter just said. He is somewhere where it echoes. It's in close environment. You can clearly see it's green screen, even the light from his face. And then I work with green screen, uh, with TV, so I know. And then, did you hear the, the phone ringing in the yes. office? Yes. <laughs> that is not true. So you tell me, can you believe everything you see? Now here's a guy, he's lying there, he's in wartime. He's, he's very silent, he's lying still. They're gonna say action now, listen, and action. And everyone's screaming suddenly. And now they're rescuing. They waited until what? Until the camera rolls. So question, was that person really in life danger? Would someone wait until the camera rolls and it's the lighting is perfect, the recording button, and then we can rescue him? You see, you can't believe everything because this is about staging. Now, when you work in TV, you know all about staging. Now, look, I'm, I'm fast-forwarding this. This was in London, in England. Look very closely. There's no one there, okay? But the news crew is setting up a protest. I'm fast-forwarding it now, okay? I'm not cutting everything, anything out. Fast-forwarding, they're setting up a protest, and then they're going to show it to the world as an actual protest happening. Listen up to what she said. She's reading every poster, and so it continues. Is this real or is it staged? Don't believe everything you see. 
Now, this was taken by a journalist. I won't mention his name. Um, they were not happy when he filled in. They tried to get rid of that, this footage. Uh, luckily, I saved it before it was taken off from the internet. But this is just, this is just incredible. Now, the next one is in Spain. Now, this woman is basically saying, watch how a Russian plane bombards a, vill a village. But they're actually taking footage from a video game. Here on the left is the actual video game, okay? They are broadcasting this in the middle. That's the actual video game. This screen on the left shows the images from the game Arma 3, an open world realism based military tactical shooter video game. And they said Russia's bombing in Ukraine and showing this footage. Now, is that true footage? Now, I have a problem when someone makes something up. You know, if you need footage, don't fabricate it. Listen to all the news channels. We are concerned about trouble and trying to be responsible. One-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same stories true without checking facts first. First, unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 Is that the same script? Is that the same script? Everyone has the same script. They are reading from the same script. No matter what TV station, local or national, same script. Now, how does that work? You tell me. How does that work? You see, only six companies controls all media in this country. It's, it's incredible. News Corp, Time Warner, Comcast, Sony, Viacom, and Disney controls all of it. All of it. Okay? And above and beyond, just look here. Here is... All the firms listed on the stock market. Can you see this graph? Now, the biggest one, uh, the biggest shareholders are BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. Okay? The biggest shareholders. Now, when you look at the news, and you can just see, okay, do they maybe control some of the media? Now, Cambridge, this is studies being done. I'm not making this up. Cambridge did a study on this. Hidden power of the big three that I just mentioned and showed you on the graph, passive index funds, reconcentration of corporate ownership and new financial risk. And they say since 2008, this whole industry has been shifted and are now dominated by what? BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street. They call them the big three. Here we, you can see everything in the stock market, more than 70% in the black are being controlled by who? Vanguard and BlackRock and State Street. Yes, the others. They control basically most of it. Financial Times says trillion dollar club titans grip on fund market during crisis. Bloomberg says BlackRock and Vanguard are less than a decade away from managing 20 trillion dollars. This was written in 2017. Now the Financial Post says with 20 trillion dollars between them, BlackRock and Vanguard could own almost everything by 2028. And so what is happening, more and more people are being bought out and the control is just getting more and more of all these companies. Global asset managers re record 4.9% increase. That's net increase. So they made more money during the pandemic. They got more control of all these firms. What, who's the top 10 global managers? BlackRock, Vanguard. And I can just go on. Europe Investigate says BlackRock, the financial leviathan that bears down on Europe's decisions. Oh, so they have control over decision making. Isn't that interesting? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this with this slide on this section. 
And this is Vanguard and BlackRock's ownership by sector. Every sector in the stock market you can think of, they own together the majority shares. It's incredible, incredible. They're basically hijacking everything. Basic materials, communications, consumer cyclical, consumer non-cyclical, energy, financial, industrial, technology, utilities, and something that's not on here, the pharmaceutical industry. Everything. So here's the question tonight that we need to face. How do we live in a world of fake news? How do we live in a world where we cannot believe everything we see, hear, or sense? Are you there? How? This is the question. And so the only solution, the answer to this, is found in the Bible, only by Scripture. You see, by the only reliable source, and that is what? That is the Bible. Now, I'm making this statement, but how do we know this is true? How do we know the Bible is reliable? Can you see the question? It's one thing to claim it, to state it. It's another thing, how do we know the Bible's reliable if we make this statement? There's a few th ways we know the Bible's reliable. The first one is by archaeology. You know, when we look at archaeology, we can just see that man, what they unearth is just incredible, showing the Bible to be true and reliable. Now, many people are making fun, like this one guy on the internet, he says, how about the embarrassing fact that the town now called Nazareth contains no artifacts, nothing in archaeology? to suggest habitation in the area until at least midway through the second century. So basically what he's stating is, Jesus could not have grown up in the town Nazareth as the Bible claims. So we have a problem because according to archaeology, there's no one that stayed in that area until the second century. But archaeologists, as they're always digging, saw something incredible. Here in the Guardian it says, is this where Jesus bathed? A shopkeeper running a small souvenir business in Nazareth has made a sensational discovery that could dramatically rewrite the history of Christianity. And what did they find? The American excavators are convinced that what Shammah has exposed is an almost perfectly preserved, what? Roman bathhouse from 2,000 years ago. Wow. In the time of Jesus and in the town where he was raised. So archaeology now can confirm, yes, there was inhabitants in a town called Nazareth. Amazing. Then also in archaeology, for years, everyone scoffed at the Bible's account of Pontius Pilate, ordering Jesus to be crucified. Really? Many have declared that he never existed. And so this was, this was fact for many years. And then something happened in the 60s. In 1961, archaeologists discovered this inscription in Caesarea with the name of Governor Pontius Pilate. They got this huge rock, and in this rock, what do you think that they see in the rock? The very name, Governor Pontius Pilate. Isn't that amazing? Archaeology, friends, confirm that the Bible is reliable. So too, history. When we look at history, what do we see? You know, one of the most uh, famous historians almost is Josephus. What did he write about Jesus? He says, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was what? Alive. Accordingly, now listen, this is a historian. He's always objective in his writing. I read his book. It's an amazing book. But listen to his conclusion. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. He's a Jew writing. He does not believe in Jesus. And he says, perhaps He's the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Isn't that incredible? Wow. And then we have different letters throughout history being written. Let me just share with you three letters. They, the Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ. As to a God. And so here, this letter is written by Pliny, Plinius in 112, just after Christ. And what do we see? 
he is describing the worship sessions they have worshiping Jesus. Here's another Roman letter. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate, and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment. Only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the dis this disease, but in the capital itself, Rome. This was written in 116 after Christ by Tacitus, and you can see he hates the Christians. Can you see that? But this is proof that they existed and Christ, and they, they were a problem to Rome. And then another letter in 120 after Christ, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished past personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. So according to this, was Jesus and the Bible real? According to these historical letters that everyone accepts as fact. Even all historians. Yes, totally. So history confirms that the Bible is reliable. And then we find prophecy. You see, prophecy confirms that Scripture is reliable. Prophecy shows us that we can trust the Bible, that it's a reliable source. Now, I just love how God himself puts this in the book Isaiah. You see, God is giving a challenge to all religions, to all gods, and to all religious texts. He says, I am God. Isn't, isn't that amazing? I am God, and there is what? None else. And there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. God says, I am God. Why? Because I give prophecy. I can predict the future. I can give a prophecy. And afterwards you can see it came out exactly as I prophesied it. And by that way, you can see I am the only true God. Which means also the word we, in which in he gave the prophecy will show that word is reliable. Namely, the Bible. Now, with that said... If you look at all religions in the world tonight, you won't find prophecy in their texts. When you look at Buddhism, they are all their holy texts. Not one of them contains prophecy. Not one. Not one prophecy. You can look, for instance, at Confucianism. They are all their religious texts. Not one of them contains prophecy. Not one prophecy. Then you can look at Islam. They are all the holy texts. And what does Muhammad himself say in the Quran? The question has been asked to Muhammad. Why is no sign, this is prophecy, being given to him, that's Muhammad, by his Lord? Now Muhammad answers. Signs, that is prophecy, are in the hands of Allah. My mission is only to give plain warning. And is, is it not enough for them that we have revealed to you this book, this is the Quran, for the instruction? And so even Muhammad himself says, there's no prophecies in this Quran. And so in Islam, no true prophecy. Yes, they expect their type of Messiah, but there's no definitive prophecy in detail. You won't find it. And then we find in Jainism. In their holy text, you can look all through it, there's no true prophecy. You can look at Shintoism throughout their holy book, there's no true prophecy. You can look at Taoism through all their texts, religious texts, there are no true prophecy. And the only religious textbook on this planet is the Bible that contains true prophecy. That is why the Bible is the only book Tonight, that we can look at with true prophecy. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Now listen to what this book says, namely the Bible. It says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Isn't that amazing? Wow, it's the Bible says of itself, this is a more sure word of what? Prophecy. The whole Bible consists of prophecy. It's foretelling, and every time we can look back and say, oh yes, it was fulfilled, which means this is a reliable text. And listen to the purpose of this prophecy, until the day dawn and the day star rise where? 
in your heart. This day star is Jesus Christ. You see, the aim of prophecy is not only to show us you know, that God is true and His Word is true. It is to share Christ Jesus with us that He can become real to our lives. Now, what do we see when we look at Scripture? We see different prophecies throughout Scripture. Jesus said about prophecy in Matthew 24, 25, Behold, I have told you what? Before. Okay, so that is prophecy. Before it happens, he foretells it, and then we can see it happens. Now, what is the first prophecy we find in the Bible? Anyone? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Oh, wow. This is a prophecy of the Messiah. And throughout the whole Old Testament, it is filled with Messianic prophecies. Hundreds of them. Now, I need to tell you, the chances for Jesus to fulfill just eight of the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament is one to the, uh, in ten to the power of 17. Do you know how much that is? Do you know how much that is? If, if I take the, the whole of Texas and cover it with, with, with a quarter for a foot deep and just mark one little coin and mix it in between the whole Texas covered with coins and you go and pick the right coin blindfolded, that is the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight prophecies. Can you imagine that? There's not only eight. There are hundreds, hundreds of prophecies. It's just incredible. We're going to look at some of these prophecies. The first prophecy we're going to look at is that of Jesus' birth. Was Jesus the Messiah? Oh, how do we know? We should look at prophecy. So we're going to look at prophecy. And here's the Old Testament. Jesus' birth. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So the Old Testament in Isaiah says, he will be a male child, be born in this world, did, and was that fulfilled many years after that? Oh, absolutely. When we go to the New Testament, the Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? From their sins. Question, was he male, like the prophecy said? So what's the odds? It's 50-50. Can you determine your gender when you're born? No, Jesus could not. And so that prophecy was Specifically fulfilled. Then the Old Testament says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, thou, though be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, and whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so the Bible prophecy says in the Old Testament, he will be born where? In Bethlehem. Uh, please, let me go back there. It says there, Bethlehem, but thou Bethlehem. And so the exact way that it was described many, many years before, now we see it confirmed in the New Testament. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, precisely fulfilled. Wow. More prophecies about his birth. In the Old Testament it says, The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring what? Gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. So dromedaries, these, these wise men, were they wise men coming to the child, bringing him gifts? Yes, the New Testament says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts. What? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
precisely as it was foretold, prophesied hundreds of years before. Now what about Jesus' life? Are there any prophecies about his life? Totally. We see, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is the Old Testament. It's a prophecy. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, what do we see? Do we see Jesus being filled with the Spirit, starting his ministry? And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. Isn't that amazing? Wow, the Spirit of God came upon him exactly as the Old Testament predicted. Then another prophecy in Isaiah. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Will hold thine hand, will keep thee. Give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the what? The blind eyes. Did Jesus open as the Messiah blind eyes? Absolutely. When we go to the New Testament, the Bible says, and Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Did Jesus open the blind eyes? Totally. Wow. And then another prophecy about his life. The Bible said in the book Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a what? On a donkey, a colt, the fell of a donkey. So he will come into Jerusalem riding on a what? A donkey. What do we see in the New Testament? Jesus they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, set him on them, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Exactly fulfilled to the T. And then the last part of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' death. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. Do you know that? The Bible says in Zechariah 12, And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. The Old Testament said that Jesus will be crucified. Was he crucified? Yes. The Bible says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. Exactly as the Bible prophesied. Then we see in the Old Testament, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The very words that he will say while he's on the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my roaring? This happened while Jesus was on the cross. And at the ninth hour, the New Testament says, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, what? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's fulfilling the prophecy exactly, word for word. One more. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, that is grave. Okay, this is the Old Testament prophecy. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus will not corrupt, his body will not corrupt, he will not stay in the grave according to the prophecy. Was that fulfilled? Oh yes, you bet it was fulfilled. The Bible says he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, in the grave. Now he's quoting this very prophecy in the Old Testament. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God, what? Raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Amen. Wow. Jesus rose from the dead, from the very grave. Friends, Buddha is still in his tomb tonight. Krishna is still in his tomb tonight. Muhammad is still in his tomb tonight. Pope John Paul II is still in his tomb tonight. Elvis Presley 
is still in his tomb tonight, and Michael Jackson is still in his tomb. But praise the Lord, Jesus Christ is what? He's not in his tomb anymore. He rose from the dead, the Bible says. This way we know Jesus is the only true Messiah and way to God. Can you see that? Yes. There's no other way beside this. Now I can tell you tonight, what I'm sharing with you is politically incorrect. These days you're not allowed to say that one religion is above the other, and this one is wrong, and so forth and so on. But guess what? It's the Bible truth. It's truth. So you can decide, you know, will you just go along with lies, or do you want truth in your life? According to Scripture, Jesus is the only true Messiah on way to God. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way. The what? The truth and the life. Not fake news, the truth and the life. This is Jesus. And so when we look at Scripture, uh, friends, we can see that the Bible is reliable by means of prophecy. Yes, we can see outside of the Bible by archaeology, by history, but especially by prophecy. The Bible is reliable, and Scripture should be our lens through which we view the world. This should be our filter. When we listen to what's going on, when we see what is going on, we should have this filter of Scripture and its prophecies. Now guess what? There's one more way that we know that Scripture is true, and this is by a changed life. I can tell you tonight that the Bible is true because I experienced it. I can tell you tonight that it's reliable because I felt its power change my life. And who can argue with someone sharing that this happened in their life? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, the gospel is what you need in your life. What is the gospel? Paul says in Corinthians, what is the gospel? He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is the gospel? Jesus died for you. He was buried for you. And he rose for you. Amen. That is the gospel. I need that. How can I have that? How can I be saved? How can I have this change in my life and Jesus be real to me? There's three steps I want to share with you before I close tonight. This is crucial. If we want, want to go on a venture seeing what is going on in the world, seeing the schemes of the Antichrist, we need to know Jesus Christ personally. Amen? The first step, repent. The Bible says, Romans 2, 4, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. The first step in coming to God is coming to God, leaving everything behind, making a 180 degree turn and coming to him. That is repentance. And his love will turn your heart towards him. That is repentance. It, it, it's not just happening by yourself, by your own works. It is through God's goodness that he draws you to repentance. The second step is confess and accept. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I need to confess my sins and accept his forgiveness and him as my savior. That is step two. And then step three, I just love this one. Surrender and a new birth. You see, I need to give my life totally to him. Not just come to him and accept his forgiveness and him as Savior. I need to give my life to him. That he will be my Lord and be baptized. Jesus answered, said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'm not telling you tonight to be part of my church. I'm just sharing you what the scripture says. You need to be born again and give your life to Christ. Now, just before this photo I showed you there in the, this baptistry, 
This brother, a friend of mine, Chuck Holmes, also wanted that same day to be baptized. But he tore his uh, Achilles tendon and he had to have surgery and he couldn't get into the baptistry. And so we made a plan to baptize him in his own pool at home. We did that. He gave his life to Jesus. He surrendered all. And a few days thereafter, he died after the surgery. Uh, that just broke my heart. And that funeral service was very tragic, very sad. But guess what? There was hope. Why? Because he gave his life to Christ before he died. It was one of the most saddest funerals and one of the most happiest funerals in my life. It was actually extraordinary. Corporal Charles Chuck Holmes, only 49 years old. And that's why I don't know when I'm going to die, neither do you. And that's why Jesus should be real in my life. That's the foundation of prophecy. If we want to look at all the things, New World Order, Antichrist, everything going on, I need to know the foundation of prophecy is what and who? Jesus Christ. And he needs to be in my life. Now, I'm going to share with you the last warning out of Scripture. Every night we're going to look at a portion of this warning. It's found in Revelation chapter 14. And out of this warning that God sends to this world just before Jesus comes, we will look at every section and then look at what is happening in the world and see the fulfillment and we will be stunned. Now, let me share with you this message. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the what? The everlasting gospel. Tonight we looked at the everlasting gospel. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. They followed another angel saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We're going to look at this in detail. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the what? The beast, that's the Antichrist, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment descendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And at the conclusion of this warning message going to the world, what happens? Listen now, verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. When this message has gone to the world, Jesus comes. His last warning message. And beloved friends, we need to heed this warning message because we are living in crazy times. So in conclusion tonight, you have a choice. You can have media that's in control of your mind or Jesus Christ, the God who's in control. Will he be in control of your life? That's the question. The question, who, what will be in control of your life? Don't miss tomorrow evening, okay? Tomorrow evening we're going to look at standing amid society's moral collapse. We are busy building the foundation to look at these amazing prophecies and to see the world events and understand what is going on in the world right now. Thereafter, Wednesday evening, we're going to look at the lecture on the brink of World War III. And then the last piece of the foundation we will build is facing the Antichrist's great reset. That is on Thursday evening. These four evenings will have laid the foundation and then next week we will build the walls of this whole house and so that we can understand what is going on in the world. Please don't miss these lectures. If you want these on DVD, if you attend eight nights of the 12, text your name and your last name to that number. 
and I'll make sure you get those. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Father, what a wonderful privilege that we could just set time aside tonight to study your word and to look at what is happening in the world right now. Oh, Father, illusions, lies, fake news. We are being bombarded with Many ideas and information. How, would we, how will we know what is true? What is really going on? Oh, Father, help us to see the bigger picture. But first of all, Father, help us to start with the basics. May Jesus be real to us. May He be part of our lives. May Scripture be our true and reliable source so that we can view all of this, understand it, and have hope and meaning in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.